Greetings, and welcome to Dougie Dialogues. I'm Dr. Monique Mitchell, and we're webcasting from Dougie Center in Portland, Oregon. Dougie Center, the first childhood bereavement center in the United States, is recognized as an international leader in the childhood bereavement field for supporting children and families who are grieving. In these 30-minute discussions, Dougie Center staff explore language, trends, research, theories, and other relevant topics related to death, dying, loss, and grief. Our intention is to continue to shape the professional dialogue in the field, and we hope to spark some thought-provoking conversations along the way. Dougie Dialogues are primarily intended for an audience of professionals working to support children and families who are grieving. If you're looking for lived experience or support for your own grief, head on over to our Dougie Center podcast, Grief Out Loud, on iTunes or your favorite listening platform. Thanks so much for joining us and welcome to Dougie Dialogues. Donna, I'm really looking forward to this Dougie dialogue with you today to talk about community response and what that means and what are some ones that we've done that have gone well, uh, maybe some best practices around that and what are some maybe that have been challenging and just things for other people who are doing community responses to be thinking about. Yeah, Jana, it's great to just have a little time to talk about kind of things we remember, lessons learned, um, I think, you know, for me, one of the basics and most important kind of foundational things is to be invited somewhere, not to just show up and sometimes in these kinds of things can become part of a problem when people just show up. Mm -hmm. And uh, so building relationships so that we do get invited when there are things, whether it's in schools or sports teams. I mean, you've done and I've done, we've done things together at uh, a lot of school responses after deaths of students, deaths of uh, other faculty members and so on. So I think that just makes sure, for me, one of the keys is make sure you're invited. And I mean, another thing I just throw out there is uh, even though people tell you what you're going, coming into, it doesn't always show up in the way they've described. <laughs> yeah, and I, and I think- we've, we've both had that experience as well. I don't know if I've never not had that experience in doing <laughs> a community response. And one of the things about community response that's interesting is what is a community response? Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of what our work is when someone calls us and says there's been a death in our community, whatever that community is, is around really being clear of what do we do and what do we not do. And so mm -hmm. just wondering, like, when I think about the components of a, a community response, at least from Dougie Center, I was thinking about um, helping someone, helping in a school administrator, helping a coach, helping uh, the leader of a religious organization, whatever it might be, helping them figure out, like, how do we share the news that someone in our community has died? Who knows? Who doesn't know? What are some of those policies that they have in place? And then also figuring out like what are the components and ways that we as Dougie Center might be helpful? And that could be offering a peer support processing session for maybe um, students or kids who are really close to the person who died. It could be meeting with parents and caregivers to share some information, more of that educational piece of what are kids and teens look like when they're grieving? What are ways that we can support them? Uh, it might also be just providing resources and referrals for other agencies in the community that could really support them in that. So are there other parts of a community response that you think about? Well, I think your point is a really, really good one, which is not to come in with kind of a canned presentation of like, hey, we're riding in on this big horse to, give you everything you didn't know you needed kind of thing, <laughs> but rather, and I, I, the community requests that I'm thinking of over the last 20, 30 years, usually do start with somebody saying, calling us, whether it's a school, a coach, could be a parent saying, this happened, 
we're not sure what to do. Can you help us? And then it's thinking through with them and who are the other players who ought to be involved in decision making in terms of whatever your community, whether it's a school or it's a, again, a sports team, athletic team or a youth center could be, could be also we've done some with organizations where they've had a staff member die. And I think it's helping them think through what they really need and what they really want and what we can offer. So, and, and sometimes, as you well know, we, we wind up just kind of being in that sort of advisory role. Other times it's hands-on and we're doing groups or we're showing up at a specific event. I mean, the last year in terms of pandemic, everything we've been doing has been virtual, but again, it's really based on what the community needs and, and what they want and not just what we want them to do or what we, we think they should do. Yeah, so. I feel like that's a big part of the conversations I have with people is, especially in the immediacy, like someone has just died and there's so much urgency to provide services and to do something right now. And then talking with them a day or two, time goes on and it's like this immediate sense of we have to do something, but then really they connect with their community members and find out maybe they want something totally different or they're not ready for a group processing session or a support group or even a, an educational informational meeting. Um, so always wanting to honor just that urgency that comes for administrators and teachers and community leaders of wanting to provide something um, and helping them. Oftentimes it's just validating like what you've done is exactly what we would have encouraged you to do. Yeah, yeah. And it reminds me too that a lot of times as adults in our efforts to kind of make sure we're doing the right thing, uh, sometimes the adults think that the teens or the kids want something that isn't really geared to them or isn't what they really want to do. And so that's also, uh, I think, a process of discussion of uh, what what best meets the needs. And, and it varies. In some communities, you know, I, we've done a couple recently, you and I together with smaller, more rural communities. And what was conceptualized as what might be wanted isn't actually what concretized into what people really wanted. So, you know, it's, it's not always the same thing. Yeah, I thought it might be interesting to talk about maybe the difference between a community response that we've done in-person times and a community response that we've done now virtually of having to adapt that. And I, I think through to one of the one of the more like comprehensive ones that I know I was a part of pre-pandemic when we were meeting in person and it was a very multi-leveled approach of a high school student had died and I was in a lot of conversations with the head of the school counseling department who was then communicating with the administrators and throughout our time of supporting them we did a meeting with the administrators and the counseling staff to kind of just help them chart out how they were going to be supporting students and families over the next few days then we did a peer support group for the friends of the student who died, like the closest self-identified friends mm -hmm. off campus. We did that through a parent who hosted mm -hmm. it. And then we did a whole staff meeting, really educational, helping teachers feel like they had a few skills and some more information about grief. And then a follow-up meeting with uh, school staff who identified as continuing to be affected and needing some more emotional processing time and less educational time. And then follow up phone calls throughout the year, two year, three years later from the counseling staff as the anniversary of the student's death came up, as the graduation came up. And so that was one that I feel like we were involved for quite a while in a comprehensive way. But then there's ones where it's just a consultation phone call or an educational meeting for a parent group. And then that's all they needed from us. Um, but just wondering, like, what stands out for you for the virtual ones that we've done? Yeah, it's tricky. I mean, for me, it's not as, uh, I don't know what the word is. I was going to say satisfying. That's not exactly the word I mean, but it's, it's, it feels less what 
I wish we could do, but it's better than, I think, better than doing nothing. Uh, but we've done, you and I did together after a staff member died at a local nonprofit, we did some, actually, a, we did a kind of all staff, semi-instructional sort of, here's what you may expect to see in each other and yourselves as you're grieving this loss that of one of your staff that you can't be in person around. And then we offered them as well, smaller kind of for people who wanted to, to share or wanted to share on a deeper level. And of course, we're most of us are used to doing more things by Zoom. Uh, it, it's not the same as being in person. I think though there might be some people that maybe are more comfortable that way because they might be able to just kind of turn their screen off, still be present, still be listening, and yet not have to be watched. So I, re I remember too, uh, Jana, the, one of the responses we did to a larger community where there had been a number of deaths of, of you, teens and one of the parents of one of the teens who had died was actually on the call and for a while chose to not be live but was listening and then joined in later and it was extremely helpful her insight and her thoughts around what the teens were doing and what they needed from the community and i i don't know whether that could have worked as effectively in person when someone might feel like you're on a stage or you're everyone's looking at you so i mean i think we we all have tried to make the best of of the distance um, but it 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 does seem and maybe it's because we're all grappling with different losses and grief and change and over zoom you know, overload, that things don't have the same mm, longevity that we've been involved in, in situations where we're able to meet in person. By longevity, do you mean like um, ways that we would continue to be involved with the community? Yeah, yeah. Not necessarily the length of a specific meeting, but like over time. And I don't know, I mean, I think I'll know more when I look back in two years. And I'm not sure how to assess that. I'm not sure what that really looks like or means, but I just have a sense that like we're all scrambling to stay on top of everything. And then a next wave of something hits and it, it just seems harder to stay connected, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like there's too many things to choose from to be focusing on that could be creating grief or uh, challenge for us. So it's hard to stay with just this one event possibly that's happened. And, you know, one of the things about the virtual that I've really appreciated is in the past, we have most of our community response has been pretty hyper local. You know, we're in Portland, Oregon, and it's been just kind of the tri-county area. And because of the virtual opportunity, we've been able to support communities a little bit further out, still in Oregon, but uh, you know, Oregon's so varied in terms of topography and geography and social dynamics and that we have a lot of rural parts of Oregon. And, you know, I think about the one community we worked with where they were, they're such a rural community where everybody knows each other and they just knew if they had a meeting and invited people to come and talk about their grief, like that was not gonna, that wasn't gonna happen. Yeah. <laughs> and so I really appreciated, we worked with them and they, they know their community best and they had the creative idea to just do a video of us having a conversation about some things about grief that they could share with people who could watch in their own time in their own home without having everyone know that they're watching it. So it's been a good learning experience for me of recognizing just how important it is for the community to determine for themselves what's going to be most effective. Yeah, and I, I think there are also some sort of, I guess, the best way I could describe it, like hybrid opportunities. So we worked with a school where there had been uh, the suicide death of a student and they were trying to decide if they could do anything in person and 
And if so, how they could do that. And they knew they, at the time, it was impossible to do anything like an assembly or a large scale something. And we really kept brainstorming with them and they decided to have a place at the school that was um, outside, but undercover because of the potential of our rainy Oregon <laughs> weather, right? Uh, where they could actually have uh, butcher block paper and writing utensils and kids could come staying six feet apart and outside and mask, but share their sentiments in that way with the family, much as we've often done in school settings when school has been in where kids can write things that are often given to the family. So uh, there were opportunities for candle lighting and so on. So it was kind of one of those more hybrid-y type mm -hmm. compromises. And again, it wasn't a school of 4,000 kids. It was a smaller school where something like that was perhaps a little more practical in terms of the logistics of it. Yeah. You know, and I just think on the personal level too about a community response, like when I'm getting ready to do a peer support group after doing it for so many years, I still have a little bit of like, ooh, I wonder how group's gonna go today, but I have a general sense of how it's gonna go and I don't feel too nervous. But when it comes to a community response, I notice I definitely have a lot more questions and uncertainties and I just get more nervous. And so I just wondered, What's hard for you about a community response? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think a few of them that we've done uh, virtually, we've had sometimes 10 or 12 people on a Zoom call and just even really knowing, like we introduce ourselves and, but people maybe have different agendas or different needs or different abilities to make decisions. And it's not always clear who that person is or who those, you know, what the dynamics are. Um, not that that doesn't also happen in person, but, you know, in person, you can sort of say, hey, let's take a walk down the hall, <clears throat> excuse me, discuss this. Can't really do that. It's such a great point, Donna, of how in virtual, there's not really the same uh, organic opportunity to invite someone who maybe has a lot come up in the middle of a processing or even an educational session and say, hey, we could step out and talk or connect after. Um, so I've been grateful that we've been collaborating with some other organizations in town who can provide additional staff on the virtual call that if somebody does need to step out, they can step out into a, a breakout room and have that connection. But it's just a lot more uh, technology to navigate. And Well, and also the whole chat feature where somebody could be asking something that's really, really important to them, or it can go kind of off course, or, and it's very hard if you don't have somebody like assigned to chat, to be talking and trying to read the chat or respond to the chat at the same time. So I think those are just some of the kind of multitasking challenges in, inherent in the, the Zoom world. Yeah, it's interesting when I think about like what are best practices when it comes to community response and those are hard to say because community responses are so different and unique. And in person, I would usually feel comfortable going out and doing a community response by myself if it was a smaller event. Like one time I went out and met with a soccer team of eight year olds who had had a teammate die. And we just sat on the soccer field and talked about grief and talked about what helps them when they're having a hard time. And that felt totally easy to navigate on my own. But I've noticed in virtual land, the, the necessity of having two people, at least two people, um, I can't imagine doing community response on my own without someone to monitor the chat or take care of other people coming into the room and things like that. Yeah, when I think about some of the things, uh, your soccer team reminded me, I once was asked to meet with a troop of Boy Scouts, and I think there must have been 30 or 40 of them, kind of 10 to 12-ish, and they had been hiking and they came upon a person who had died, who was in the woods. And, you know, they were struggling with that. I sure would not want to be virtual with, you know, 40 kids faces that I can't be in person with and a couple leaders and like kind of black. I feel like sometimes I'd just be like blabbing away. And I don't really know 
what they're experiencing. Whereas in person, you can see more and you can sense and <clears throat> they can pop in and out with questions and, and you can foster a little bit more interaction in that way. So I think it's more challenging. And I agree, Janet, uh, you know, if I had, you know, five or six people on a Zoom call, so be it, but it's really helpful to have another person. You and I have done quite a few of them and other combinations of staff, mm -hmm. so. Yeah, the other best practice I think about sometimes is, at least back in the in-person times, and I think this is just as valid in the virtual times, is to make sure that whoever the community partner is, that somebody from the organization or the school or the sports team is also there because they know the kids, they know the teens, they know the parents and the caregivers, and they're gonna be a, a, a person that can be a touchstone for that local connection and ongoing support too. So that's another recommendation I would have for people. Yeah, like a transitional person, at least mm -hmm. one, because they're the ones who will be in, in the lives of the, the people who are participating over time. Yeah. Anything that you think about in terms of how community response experiences has changed your understanding about grief in that kind of setting or how you do this work? I, I don't know if it's changed, Anna, but I would say maybe it has uh, confirmed some things which are really for me, try not to make assumptions, is to go in with an open mind and, and you know, really be available to listen to the situation, to the barriers that might be there and the opportunities that might be there and help the parties who are involved in the decision-making really to come up with the solution that best meets their needs versus coming in with kind of this canned program, here's what we do and then we're gone. Mm -hmm. I think it just gets confirmed each time because I think if, if I was coming in with something canned, it, it, it would have failed quite a few times, <laughs> miserably. <laughs> I know one thing I've learned from doing community response, especially not so much when I'm meeting with parents or caregivers or teachers or educators, but more if I'm sent in to meet with a group of kids and teens who have never met me before, don't know anything about Ducky Center, is to always ask the question of why do you all think you're here today? Because mm -hmm. many times what they think they're coming to is so different than what I think that they're coming to. And it can help bring down some of their anxiety and their trepidation if they say, well, I don't know, they told me I had to come to this room and we're going to like be sad and talk about our feelings. And I'm like, <laughs> well, that's an opportunity. That's a possibility. <laughs> but that's not the only reason why we're, why we're here today to sort of help them feel a little bit less um, worried about what the expectation is going to be. And that's why I, I've learned over the years to ask whoever is, if, if somebody's putting on a meeting or a community event or even a group, have you put anything in writing out to people? And if so, could I see what that is? Mm -hmm. Because even there've been times where what they've told me and are still telling me is not quite how it's being sort of advertised or, or crafted in writing to the public. And, th and that's really helpful to know what they think they're coming to. Absolutely, because if they say it's one-on-one -on -one counseling sessions with Donna Sherman from Ducky Center to be like, well, no, not really. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, or we'll, we'll answer all the questions you have, or, you know, there's just a lot of things that can go wrong in translation. So mm -hmm. I think it's helpful to, to really double check on that. I, um, I think we're, our time is, is winding down, Jana. Is there any like sort of gotta say gem that strikes you when you, when you take a call like that or when you go to support people who have experienced some pretty big event in their, in their own lives or in their community lives? I mean, when I think when I get the initial call, it's really figuring out who's calling me, what role do they have in this 
community or in this situation, because oftentimes we can get calls from multiple people in the same community wanting to set up different things. And so trying to get everybody on the same page um, and then trying to get a sense of what the dynamics are. Like an example might be a parent calling because they want something to be offered to the kids and they may feel like the school's not doing enough. And then the school calling wanting to do something different. And so just trying to get everybody on the same page so that we're not doing multiple community responses for the same um, mm -hmm. situation, unless that's what's warranted. I think sometimes there's a, a reason to do that. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, just so I can get clear of like, who am I talking to? And what role do, have you play, do you play? And who else have you already connected with in the community? Another reason to also have like, internally for Dougie Center staff to have one person that that gets filtered through because different people could be talking to five different staff and if we didn't have one coordinating person like you um, we might not know that we're all talking about two multiple people about the same situation so I think that that is a helpful kind of uh, internal piece that is is good to keep in mind yeah, and it leads into also trying to discern or help people discern, are they wanting a training or are they wanting a community response or are they wanting a community response that includes a training mm -hmm. as well? Because sometimes people can call and they want, they ask for a training, but what they're really needing is more community response, peer support processing, or they're calling thinking they want more of that, but what they really are needing or what their community is wanting is more education. So yeah. it just takes a little bit of conversation to suss that out. Yeah. Well, Donna, thank you for having this conversation with me. Yeah. I have to say, you know, one of the weird benefits of COVID times is that you and I have been able to collaborate so much on community response. And I've learned a lot from you and continue to learn from you. So just grateful for your willingness to talk with me and also just the work that you do in this realm. Well, th thanks, Jana. And back at you. I just always admire your ability to ask the right questions and kind of listening skills i feel like i too learn something every time we do something together so great well thanks All for right. this time together okay take care bye bye, -bye.